Well, happy Easter, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. I heard about a, a guy who, as Easter was approaching, hadn't been the most attentive husband. He hadn't been the best father. He hadn't been supportive around the house. In fact, he was pretty much a grouch. You just weren't, you just wasn't getting along with the kids. He felt real guilty about it. You know, Easter's coming, we're gonna go to church, and I feel terrible about the kind of husband and the kind of father I've been, and especially I haven't really been supportive of my wife. And so he decided he would do something kind of extraordinary. He decided that he would go buy the biggest bouquet of flowers that he could find, that he would get uh, her favorite candies or chocolates, and then he'd just make this big presentation to her, not going through the back door and the garage as he normally did. He was gonna go to the front door, surprise her, and say, here you are, I'm so sorry, I I honor you today. And so, he did, he picks up the flowers, he gets the candy, he makes his way to the front porch, and rings the doorbell, door opens, he hands her the flowers, he gives her the candy, he drops to one knee, and he starts singing, when a man loves a woman. (laughs) Girls, did he do pretty good so far? Well, here's what happened. She starts crying. She just falls apart. She's just weeping. And he goes, what, what, what did I do wrong? She goes, oh, you don't understand, honey. She said, the dishwasher broke today. Water went all through the house. Kids have been horrible. House is a wreck. She said, everything in the world has gone wrong. And now to make all these matters worse, you come home drunk. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you try to work through the guilt of life and navigate it in a positive way, and sometimes it goes right, and sometimes it doesn't. The reality, I think we'll all say, if you're married, you're thinking about getting married, or you're in any kind of relationship at all, there's no perfect relationships. There are no perfect families. I know you go to church sometime, and you have the impression that everybody else has it together except you. Just not so. Just some people are better hypocrites than you. <laughs> all of us are struggling in some way or another, In fact, there's no such thing. There are no little houses on the prairie in the room. I'll just let the pressure off. I saw this sign one time. It said, so it ain't home, sweet home. So adjust, right? (laughs) Deal with it. And that is so true. And the reason it's true is because none of us are perfect. I don't think there's a person in the room who would stand to their feet this morning and say, I've never done anything wrong. I've never treated anyone wrong. Uh, I, I don't think that would happen. I mean, I think what we all know, we know it instinctively, we know it inherently, and that is that we have struggles in our lives with sin. I mean, sin is a biblical word that just describes missing missing the mark. I mean, you say, okay, well, what is the mark? Well, the mark is perfection. (laughs) And anything in a biblical standard, anything below perfection is sin. Uh, In fact, uh, 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 Romans 3.23, for all all have sinned, and then it explains it, and come short of the glory of God. Well, the glory of God is the uh, representation of everything that God is. So anything below perfection is sin. So what am I saying? I'm just simply explaining to you that none of us are going to live our lives in such a way that we don't make make mistakes or that we don't sin. Now, I'm not trying to excuse it. We all ought to strive to do better and be better, but I'm saying at the end of the day, you have to realize Before you knew Jesus, you were a lost sinner, and now that you know Jesus, you're a saved sinner. (laughs) We're gonna deal with sin until we get to heaven. In fact, I've told you before, I would never pray for perfection. You know why? The only way you're gonna get it is when you are dead. So what you ought to do is say, God, kill me now, because that's the only way you'll ever be perfect. We're gonna be in a struggle. We're gonna be in a fight. And by the way, this struggle goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. If you really want to examine where the train came off the tracks and why we hurt one another from time to time and why we do and say things we may not even mean, but we still do them and say them, it's because all of us in this room, we all struggle with this, with this sin. It's inherent and it's in our, it's in our nature. Uh, in, the, in fact, the psalmist said, in sin, my mother conceived me, meaning I was born with, with this nature. I was born with a sinful nature. Have you noticed you don't have to teach a child to lie, you have to teach them how to tell the truth. And why is that? Because they're our kids. <laughs> they came, and you remember the firstborn child and you had that firstborn baby and you, 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 you put that baby to bed at night and all of a sudden that baby starts crying and you remember how you overreact as a young parent and all you young parents with new babies, I, 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 God bless you, but I'm just saying there's a tendency we have as young parents to overreact. You know, you run into the room, oh, something must be wrong. Should I call the pediatrician? The baby's crying and then you go through the checklist. Well, they're dry, they're fed. 
There's no reason for this baby to be crying. And so you, you put the baby down and you kind of back out of the room. You know how you do that thing. Easy, you kind of get out of the room, turn the light off and we're not crying. And all of a sudden the door closes and the baby's crying. And you run back and pick the baby up, baby stops crying. Lay baby down, baby's crying. Pick baby up, stops crying. Lay baby down. All of a sudden you realize that baby ain't, that baby ain't dying, that baby's lying. <laughs> ain't nothing wrong with that baby. That baby's okay. That baby's teaching mom and dad some things. And I'm just saying, we, we, we struggle, even at, at, that, at that level, we struggle with just getting it right and doing it right, and it's just a part of life. It does go back to the garden. And what you had in the garden was man in a perfect state. You know, when God designed mankind, he designed us in a perfect state. In fact, we were made, the Bible says, in the image of God, the Omago, the Omago Dei, the image of God. And God gave to man a tree, and he said, look, you can partake of everything in the garden except that one tree, but if you partake of that tree, then sin will enter your heart and you'll violate my commands and a lot of other bad things can happen. So enjoy the garden, enjoy your life, just stay away from the tree. And I know people say, well, what if the tree weren't there? What if God hadn't put the tree in the garden? So isn't it God's fault somehow <laughs> that uh, sin came into the world? Well, the reality of it is God placed the tree in the garden so that man would choose to love him and not love him because he had no choice. You see, if you're not free to choose to love someone, I'm sorry, if you're not uh, uh, free to refuse to love someone, you're not truly free to choose to love someone. The choice is, is, is what makes it significant. And you know the story, good night. Adam and Eve, sin in a picture. The strategy of the devil was exposed. Here's what the devil did. Here's the strategy. The devil knew God loves people, but he hates sin. So the strategy was get what God hates into what God loves. <laughs> and the minute he got what God hates into what God loves, he thought, I've just created a problem for God and I don't see how he's gonna fix that. How do you get out of that person the thing that you hate while embracing and loving that person? And the reality of it is they already worked that out. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In other words, God already had a solution before the problem ever presented itself. And can I tell you this morning, regardless of the problems you're facing in life, uh, Jesus already has a solution. Uh, by the way, there's not a problem he can't solve. You didn't come in here with something he can't handle. You've never taken a problem to God and heard him say, ah, hang on, I'm gonna have to get back to you. That's pretty, that's pretty messed up. There's not a problem. Hey, by the way, there's not a burden he can't lift. You didn't carry something into this room that God is not capable of lifting off of you. And by the way, there's not a sin you've committed that he won't forgive. God is in the business of forgiving sin. He's in the business of loving us as we are. And so the devil underestimated what God had already planned. He had planned a way whereby we could deal with this matter of sin. He prepared a way whereby we could be in fellowship with him. And what happened as a result of sin entering the picture is three very strong negative emotions happened. First was guilt. In fact, when you read that early record in Genesis 3, the Bible says that God would often walk in the evening hours of the day with Adam and Eve. He would just talk with them. They'd hang out. They'd take hikes and walks together. And now that sin into the picture for the first time, you know what Adam and Eve do? They hide. They hide. They never hid from God before. Never had a reason to. They didn't fear God. Why, why would they fear God? And all of a sudden, now that sin is in the picture and they've experienced something they've never experienced before, it's driven a wedge between them and God and they don't even realize it. And so they, they hide from him. And the Bible says when God shows up to take his walk with them, he sees that they're not there. And so he calls out, Adam, where are you? I've read that and I've often thought, really? God didn't know where they were. <laughs> When my kids, when our kids were little, our firstborn Shannon, when she was little, we were traveling one time, and so she wanted to play hide and go seek. Well, we're in the hotel room. We're thinking, well, that's not going to be pretty easy. <laughs> uh, but she was pretty little, so we thought, okay, we'll play along. You know how you do with your little kids. So she goes and she hides, and so I'm counting. And so when I look up, I see her over in the corner, and her hands are over her eyes. <laughs> you know, and you know what you do. I got you. You're busted. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> You know, instead you go, oh, where are you? I can't find you, honey. And you go looking under things. Oh, I don't know. Cindy's like, where's Shannon? I don't know. Nobody knows where Shannon is. And we play that game and she's snickering. She's loving every minute. Well, I always think about that when I read that passage. I think about Adam and Eve hiding in the corner and God's saying, where are you? And they're going, he can't see us. 
I mean, can you imagine God going, hey, come on, man, you're making me look bad in front of the angels. <laughs> come on, you can't hide from me forever. No, the, the, uh, listen, it wasn't that God didn't know where Adam and Eve were. The problem was they didn't know where they were. They hadn't had that epiphany, that moment where they realized we just disobeyed God, and in disobeying God, we've, we've created some separation here, and we feel guilty about it. We did something we shouldn't have done for the first time in all human history, so guilt was that emotion. The second emotion was feelings of being separated. You know, that happens in relationships. Somebody hurts you, you back away from them, you know? What's that old saying about hurt me once, shame on you, hurt me twice, shame on me? So you develop some distance and we tend to insulate and isolate a little bit when we're hurt. Well, that's just a natural thing, goes back in how we're wired. And so when you have this element of sin that's introduced, they're separated, they're, 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 they move out of the garden. And then the, the most powerful emotion was the condemnation that came about as a result of sin. Those are things that they had never experienced before. Those were not the best ideas for God or ideals for, of God for them to experience. It was the will of God that they live in the way in which he had created them, that they respected his rule and they stayed away from the tree, but th that train left the track. I mean, we're way past that now. And so God began to provide a way whereby they could deal with the matter of sin. And so he prepared a sacrifice. And throughout the Old Testament, you have these sacrifices that are being brought into the temple, and they're being offered on these altars. And these sacrifices were symbolic of the sacrifice one day that would come, the sacrifice God would provide in sending his son Jesus to die. And in every one of those sacrifices, think about the sins of those people being rolled forward for another year. And every year, they'd have to go back to the temple through the sacrificial system to get the sins atoned for, sins rolled forward for another year. And that happened year in and year out, thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of sacrifices that were made because of sin and separation and condemnation and the feeling, I've gotta be right with God, I've gotta connect with God. And then one day, one day, John the Baptist is baptizing on the banks of the Jordan. He looks up and he sees Jesus. Now, before that moment, Jesus had lived his life pretty much in anonymity. Um, probably ran his dad's carpentry business. He was probably a businessman because it wasn't time for him to step in the limelight and to have a public ministry. But in that moment, John announces him. And John announces him in John 1 this way. He says, behold, look. This is the Lamb of God. This is God's sacrifice. This is the Lamb of God who will take away, here it is, the sins of the world. This is the one that all those Old Testament guys were telling you about. He's here, and he's coming to this world to go to the cross to bear our sin. And the ministry of Jesus on this earth began in that moment. And everything Jesus did was preparing him for the moment in which he would go to the cross. And there at the cross, he would, through his sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, satisfy the justice of God on sin and provide a way for us through faith in him to be able to be right, to be made right, to have forgiveness, to be in heaven one day. And so it's an incredible story. It's a, it's a powerful story. It's the story of God's love for us and his desire to have us in fellowship with him. In fact, when we think about the message of Easter, we, we often look at the imagery of those crosses. Those crosses are powerful symbols and they're, they have incredible message that those crosses give. In fact, in Luke, the Bible talks about the, the imagery of those crosses, Luke 23, 33. Look at it here on the screen. It says, they come to this place called a skull. Uh, Cindy and I have been there. I, I was able to go there uh, the year after Cindy had passed away. Some guys in the church uh, took me on a trip to help me kind of navigate through that. And I remember we went there to that place they believe historically to be the place where Jesus was crucified, Golgotha. And that mountainside does have the appearance of a skull. You can see the cavernous places that would be the eyes and the mouth, and it does have that, that, uh, that appearance of a skull. Whether it's that place or some other place, the Bible says this is the place where those three crosses are are erected and they crucified him with the criminals. One on the right hand and, and the other on the left. And so you have this imagery of these three crosses. On one of those crosses, you hear one of the men, according to Luke 23, as he's challenging Jesus. If you're really the son of God, get us out of this. 
you've got all this miraculous power and we've heard you've called people back to life who have died and we've heard people who couldn't see, you've given them sight and people couldn't hear. You know, we've heard all this stuff. Well, if you've got that power and you're the son of God, save us and save yourself. He, He wanted not to have a relationship with God. He wanted kind of a commercial relationship with him. He he wanted what he could get out of God. And sadly, there are a lot of people that kind of approach God that way. They really don't want God. They want what they can get out of him, and they want what he can do for them. And, And so that was this guy. And he represented someone who was dying there on the cross, and they were dying in their sin, unchanged. In the very same condition they were born, they were dying in sin, meaning that he knew who Jesus was, but he refused to receive him. He knew what Jesus was able to do, but he still refused to embrace him. He knew that he had the power to forgive sin, but he just didn't ask him. And so this man on the cross is dying, he's dying in his sin. People often wonder, well, how is it that a person misses heaven? And how is it that a person goes to this place Jesus talked about, this place called hell? Is it because God won't save them? I, I don't believe that. Second uh, Peter 3, 9, the Bible says God is not willing. What's the will of God? He's not willing that any should perish. That any, he didn't say many. <laughs> he said any. But that all should come to repent. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world <laughs> that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would receive him, would have everlasting life. Well, then why didn't the whole world go to heaven? Because the whole world won't receive him. I'm back to the garden. I'm back to the tree. They have a choice. Instead of choosing to receive him, many choose to reject him, and that's certainly what was happening to the man at the cross. This man dying in sin, just simply refusing to receive Jesus and to ask ask for forgiveness. We hear a lot about confession your religious tradition, you've probably heard that growing up, the word confess. You know what it means? It's, it seems to be Christianese sometimes. Well, what does the word mean? It means agreement. Confess. When you confess to God, you're agreeing with him. You're basically saying, you're right, I was wrong. Kind of like what you do when you're making up with your wife, right? Honey, you were right. I'm wrong. It's confession. It's agreement. And it's what the guy on the one cross really refused to do. He just, he refused to do that. And, and some people think, well, you miss heaven and you, and you don't get to be in the presence of God in eternity. Uh, okay, so you don't ask him, but you probably committed some moral sin. I mean, isn't that the unpardonable sin the Bible speaks of? Must be some moral sin? No. Uh, okay, is it some verbal sin? Did you say something? And, and because you've said some verbal sin, you cross the line and it's an unpardonable sin that God will not forgive you. No. Well, maybe it's an intellectual sin. Maybe you embrace the wrong philosophy or ideology and, and because of some intellectual sin, you cross the line. That's not it either. When you read Matthew 23, Jesus explains the one sin that you can commit that if you die in the condition like the first man on the cross, you won't get into heaven. It's called blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin. Let me explain it. What is the role of the Holy Spirit? Third member of the triune Godhead. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will not speak of himself. Jesus said, he will speak of me. The primary role of the Holy Spirit, guys, is to bring us to an awareness of Jesus. It's to convince us that he is the Son of God. It's to move in our mind and on our heart the fact, okay, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And not only to convince us, but to convict us that we actually need him. It's one thing to intellectually accept who he is. It's another thing to be moved to make a decision about who he is. It's more than just believing. It's placing your faith in him. Uh, The Bible says the devil believes, and it even says the devil trembles. (laughs) I don't like the devil saved. So it's more than just an intellectual acceptance of who he is. It's understanding, and the Spirit of God brings me and convinces me, and and he, he convicts me, and ultimately when I receive him and I embrace him and I say, yes, he then converts me. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me give you one more image. It's like us, if the cross was here on this stage and Jesus was on the cross, the role of the Holy Spirit would be go to each one of us and take us by the hand and say, I'm gonna bring you to the cross. Jesus is paying for your sin. And Jesus, who was infinite, suffered in a finite period of time what you and I who are finite would have to suffer in an infinite period of time if we had to pay for our own sin. 
So in that infinite period of time, he and being finite paid the price for all sin and the Holy Spirit brings us and says, will you accept his payment for your sin? Will you receive that? Now you got a choice. It's the tree. We're back to the garden. You either say, yes, Lord, I receive that. I believe that. I receive that. And you accept it or you turn your back and you walk away from it and say, no, thanks. I'll pick up the tab. I'll pay for it on my own. He's going, you sure? It's going to take you a long time. No, I got it. One of the imagery of that scene is you trample under your feet the blood of Christ, meaning it's like walking through the blood that Jesus shed and being indifferent about that sacrifice. And listen, Jesus said if you die in that condition, you've blasphemed the work of the Holy Spirit, and he said that is the one sin he will not forgive. I call it the sin of unbelief. So you move from that cross where this man died in sin, You move to the second cross, and here's a man who recognized who Jesus was. He understood his power, and he wanted to get in on it. He he looks at him, and he says, Lord, would you remember me? Have mercy on me. Would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And I love what Jesus said. He didn't say, well, I gotta test the sincerity of your faith. I don't know. I'm gonna dangle you out there a little bit and make sure you're really genuine. He didn't do that. He didn't say, uh, how much of the Bible do you know? Can you quote any scripture? He didn't do that. He didn't ask him, have you given any money to help the poor or have you given to support a church? He didn't do that. He didn't say, have you ever attended synagogue? You ever been to a temple? You ever been to a church? He didn't say that. He, he, he didn't ask you. He, he didn't say, have you been baptized? He didn't do any of that. He just simply accepted the faith of this man, his desire to have his sins forgiven, and Jesus said, today, you will be with me in paradise. You know how quickly salvation can happen in someone's heart? Instantaneously. You say, you don't know what I've done. Don't need to know what you've done. (laughs) I don't really want to know what you've done. In my tradition, or my profession rather, sometimes people feel it necessary to unburden themselves and share with me some of the things that they're most ashamed of in their life. And I always like to say, this is actually not necessary. (laughs) <laughs> but if it'll make you feel better. And here's what I've known. If you want somebody to be comfortable talking to you, never look shocked. <laughs> never look shocked. And in my line of work, <laughs> I want to say, you did what? <laughs> you sick puppy. No, I don't ever say that. <laughs> I never say that. Never said that. I did think it. Might as well said it. Did think it. And, and, you know, you buried them where? <laughs> no, it's never happened. <laughs> never happened. Never happened. But here's the point. Uh, th- th- this idea of I got to tell someone, I need to share, I need to confess, it's just inherent within us. And I love what the Bible says. The Bible says we have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, who was all points tempted and tested as we are, yet he without sin. You've never brought a sin to him that he would not forgive. I said the only sin he won't forgive is you die rejecting him ultimately as your savior. Every other sin he'll forgive. Jesus said, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Paul was the first religious terrorist. He put Christians to death. He made life miserable. And God saved that man, forgave his sin. He wrote over half the New Testament. There's nobody so messed up that God will not forgive them. And the man on the cross experienced God's amazing forgiveness. And one day in heaven, you and I will get to meet him. Here's the last thought. You have the man on the center cross. One died in sin. One died to sin. Jesus died for sin. Literally, when you think about the cross and the imagery, the Bible says there was a moment on the cross when it became as dark at midnight, uh, as dark as midnight at noonday. So there at the cross, noon rolls around, the sun is at its highest point, and now it's as dark as though it were midnight. And out of the darkness, you hear this lone voice screaming out from the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which was interpreted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And people often wondered what was happening in that moment. Well, I think I know, and I think I can explain it. In that moment, the sins of the world were completely placed upon Jesus. He had not sinned. 
The Bible said he knew no sin. The Bible said he did no sin. In fact, when Pilate tried to find anything wrong that Jesus ever did, he said, I can't find, I can't, I can find no fault in him. Never said a thing he shouldn't have said, never went a place he shouldn't have gone, never treated somebody bad. I mean, Pilate had the best investigative forces in the world trying to find one thing he did wrong. Couldn't find anything. Can you imagine if all the investigative forces that we have in our country were looking for one something that you and I did wrong, how long it would take them to find that? <laughs> they picked me up about 30 seconds. I mean, the Bible even says the thought, listen, the thought of foolishness is sin. Who among us have not had at least one foolish thought since we've been in here? <laughs> I'm just saying, as Clint Eastwood said in Unforgiven, we got it coming. <laughs> There's none righteous, no, not one. Remember, all of sin comes, remember that one? So Jesus did nothing wrong. Pilate said, I can find no fault in him, and yet Jesus is crucified not because he said he was God, he was crucified because they said he was a king. And the law of the land was if you uh, give allegiance to anyone higher than, uh, than Caesar, it's treason, it's a capital offense. So the superscription on the cross is here is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, king of the Jews. Roman, Rome's put him to death because of treason. My point is that where he was on that cross, the sins of the world rolled upon him and he became so completely sin that a holy and just God could no longer look upon sin and the father had to turn his back on his son. And the last thing Jesus said before he gave up his spirit and he died, he said, it is finished. It's finished. He didn't say, I'm finished. That wouldn't have surprised anyone to hear a dying man say, I'm done. That's not what he said. He said, it is finished, meaning, meaning everything necessary for sins to be forgiven is done. Listen, everything necessary for us to go to heaven one day, done. Everything necessary for God to embrace you and love you, done. He did all the heavy lifting at the cross, and when he walked out of that grave on Easter morning, the Bible said the keys of death and hell were hanging at his side. And today he stands before us as the savior of the world, the man on the middle cross who died for our sin. And all we have to do is do like the one guy on the cross and just say, Lord, remember me. I need you in my life. I can't do this anymore. I need a peace that passes all understanding. I, I, I need to have joy unspeakable and full of glory. I, I wanna live a life and live it to the full. And I can't do that separated from my creator. So, Lord, I need you. You know what will happen if you pray a prayer like that? He will receive you. I've told you before that beautiful hymn that they would close the Billy Graham Crusades in, just as I am, without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come. You come to Jesus, you come just as you are. Messed up, mad, confused, sinful, I mean, you, you come like you are. Just come like you are. And when you come to him, you'll find that he will receive you just as you are. Christianity is not behavior modification. He doesn't change you so he can love you. He loves you so that he can change you. Romans 5, 8, while we were still sinful, Christ died for us. He loves you that much. And I love how Romans 8, when Paul wrapped his mind around it, remember I said you had guilt and you had separation and you had condemnation. Read Romans 8. Romans 8, Paul said, who will charge anything to God's elect? Who can accuse his kids of anything is what he was saying. There's no guilt. When the devil tries to accuse you of your past, you say, God's forgiven me. He forgave me at the cross. When he brings up something you've done, you say, God's forgiven me. He forgave me at the cross. He put our sins as far as the east is from the west. And what Paul was saying in Romans 8, nobody can lay any charge against you that God has forgiven you. You belong to him. No guilt. What about separation? Well, the last part of Romans 8 says, who shall separate us from the love of God? Well, height, their depth, their angels, their principalities, or things present, or things to come. He said, nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. No guilt, no separation. What about condemnation? Feelings of condemnation. Well, Romans 8 opens, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
Paul discovered that everything we lost in the garden, we, re, re, we regained in Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful thought? All because of Easter. Let's pray. Lord, as we prepare to worship and receive communion, I pray that you will move in the hearts of your people to encourage them today. Lord, let us know, though we have felt away from you and we haven't felt close to you, that that road back is so short. So for some of my friends this morning, I pray you'll draw them close to you. May they feel your love, your mercy, and your grace. And then for others who may be watching online or others in this room who may never have placed their faith in you, Father, impress upon them it's not a matter of understanding and coming to faith. It's a matter of believing. Understanding follows the believing. So I pray you'll give them the courage to place their faith, to place their faith in you. Lord, I pray they'll pray a simple prayer like this and say, Lord Jesus, in this room on an Easter Sunday, I confess to you my need for a Savior. I ask you, Father, now in this moment to forgive me of my sin. I pray, Lord, that I can experience your peace. I pray that I can know real lasting joy through this new relationship with you. And in this moment, with everything I know about me, I now trust all that I know about you. Come into my heart, forgive my sin. And that's the prayer that I pray in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love to know it. You can email me, bramseymetchurch.com. I'd love to talk to you about that, get to know you a little better.